Hey, welcome back to Uregina 120. I am Jeff Cliff, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned at the University of Regina that I think that you should know. And today we're going to be talking about another logical fallacy, the fallacy of association. So before I even start, uh, I probably can't do this topic nearly as good of a, a justice as the TV Tropes uh, wiki article on this particular subject. So you'll probably save some time if you just close this video, go read that page, uh, and then maybe come back and watch the video afterwards. But they do a fantastic job, and it's hilarious. Go read it. Uh, and uh, as kind of another point, I'm still realizing things and learning about this particular topic. Uh, it sounds simple, and you may, uh, if you just read about it for the first time today, not get some of the subtleties involved. Uh, but just be forewarned, uh, it's a little bit more complicated than I'm probably capable of getting through in, in the context of one video. So just kind of leave your mind open for that. So how this is going to work is that uh, when we encounter something that we don't understand, or if we count encounter something that we don't see a lot, uh, or that we don't have a lot of experience with, uh, our natural incl inclination, if we care to even pay attention, is to start trying to think of reasons, uh, or to try to explain it to ourselves at least, to come up with guesses or hypotheses of how this new experience or this new thing is related to other things that we know. And we'll associate it with other things, other properties of things we've experienced, of maybe groups we've encountered, um, and we try to kind of make sense of it in that way. You know, we have all these experiences to draw from, and we'll draw from some of them and kind of make a guess. And the problem is, is some of the guesses we can make are kind of advantageous for us. Uh, some of them explain uh, and provide insight into how the world works, maybe, and some of them don't. And we're going to kind of explain, hopefully, one of the ways it, it doesn't, or a guess could fail to uh, really explain the situation in a meaningful way and, or a useful way. And so you can view this fallacy uh, as not even necessarily a fallacy, but how learning and guessing can go wrong. So the first example. is from St. Turing, uh, Alan Turing, uh, the founder of computer science, or at least certainly one of them. Uh, and he worried uh, at the time or, of or near his death uh, that humanity would learn nothing from his experience and his ideas except for this conclusion, uh, based on this particular argument, that Turing believes that machines or computers can think, and that Turing lies with men i.e. Uh, he was gay, and that therefore, uh, at least in the, the context of his particular civilization, where gay people were not trusted, that machines or computers cannot think. And so uh, this is a kind of version or a way of drawing a conclusion from that particular situation that uh, is certainly not warranted. Uh, but it's worth looking into the reasons why it's not warranted and why we could even make this conclusion, never mind thinking about it in terms of whether that conclusion might be valid or not. And so the, the problem here is that we are too quickly uh, concluding or too quickly associating uh, things with each other. So for example, uh, we could look at the association between uh, gay people and the, their honesty. And so in early 20th century England, uh, there may have been some dishonesty from the gay community towards their government. Quite honestly, because if you got caught being gay, 
uh, you were sentenced to severe uh, and harsh penalties. Uh, Alan Turing ended up killing himself because of what he had been put through for the crime of being born with a predisposition uh, for uh, falling in love with men. And so the, if someone were alive at the same time and observing what happened to him, uh, it stands to reason that they would probably lie to get out of the situation that Turing himself found himself in. Uh, it makes perfect sense why they would do so. Um, and so there's this reason why that they may have been dishonest that does not necessarily uh, have anything to do with machines or gay people's relations to machines. All it has to do with is the relationship between gay people and their government who are, is at least at that time oppressing them. Um, and then the second problem, of course, is the association between uh, machines that can think and Turing in that particular sense. Turing lived, you know, 50, whatever, maybe 60 years ago, um, and well, probably certainly closer to 70 you now, but I mean, he's dead. He's gone. Uh, great man. But the universe went on without him. Uh, and if Britain had lost the war or had lost the First World War and he had never been born, we still eventually would have found computers. That we may have got them through Conrad uh, Zusek uh, or even uh, by someone digging up the papers of Ada Lovelace. Uh, sooner or later, we would have encountered the idea, come up with the idea, and started to develop the ideas that Turing himself had made. Uh, and we would have concluded at some point in the same way that Turing concluded that machines might be able to think, and it's worth considering their abilities to think, or at least think in some uh, definition of the word think. And so we, we, we risk, uh, when we make these associations, uh, making the wrong association. And so what kinds of ways can we approach this uh, so that we don't make the wrong association, or if we do, that we can at least correct it? And the first might just be uh, that we have to have access to a more uh, complicated uh, and varied uh, set of evidence. Because part of the problem when you have uh, gay people, in, as in the tw early 20th century England, uh, not really being public about their nature, is that there was probably a fair number of people who didn't have direct experience with gay people in certainly a positive light. Uh, if people were hiding the fact that they were gay, uh, you could probably live a substantial amount of your life and not know that people around you uh, are so, and not know that the nice people that you have positive experience from uh, are part of this group that you would only hear about. And the only way you would hear about them is from people who don't like them, maybe the government, uh, or other people who are filled with hatred and you would just not necessarily get the full picture. So one approach might just be to get as much kind of perspectives on topics like this as possible. So when a hypothesis, when a guess like this comes out, that you can weigh it against other evidence. Um, you can also see this uh, a as a matter uh, where it's it has to be possible for you to be wrong and to be able to uh, admit that you're wrong without too much stigma being attached to it. In the case of the early 20th century, uh, there may have been, and I don't know, you can look this up, but there's probably some people who respected Turing as an engineer and as a mathematician, uh, but who would not have been comfortable uh, admitting as much about his particular uh, condition, i.e. homosexuality, because it would have caused too much kind of cognitive dissonance uh, it would have been too stressful for them to do so. They would have probably just stayed silent. Again, I don't know, uh, but it's worth thinking about that uh, if they were able to speak more honestly about it without the fear of being shamed publicly, uh, just as a means of diffusing these kind of poorly uh, thought out of associations, uh, it might have helped. It's hard to tell in retrospect, but there's certainly more cases of this kind of association being made in modern times that we can try to test it out. Uh, the other point is to just look at uh, the, the kind of form of conclusion in general, 
uh, and to see if it's possible that it could be not true, and if the generalization is too strong, if counterexamples could be present. Um, and so, if you can find, for example, a machine that thinks, then this argument is moot. Uh, and although this argument may be a reason not to look for such a machine, uh, the, the people who do the work of finding this uh, can, of course, undo the whole argument. Let's look at another example. recent example, uh, bombs use circuits, uh, which is true. Some bombs at least do. Uh, this clock has a circuit. I don't have a clock in front of me, but you can kind of imagine a clock with a circuit, or you can Google a clock with a circuit, and therefore this clock is a bomb. Well, uh, there's something a little bit wrong with this argument here, uh, because while the premises are true, uh, the conclusion in this case was false. And so right away you have to look for something, you know, something has gone wrong here, something is mistaken. And the, the, the problem here is that uh, it's missing the possibility that there may be other things that use circuits. I would venture a, a strong guess that the vast majority of circuits made by humankind have not been attached to bombs. There have, of course, been many bombs made, and many of them have had circuits attached, but just looking at the number of cameras in the world, uh, there, there's billions of cameras now, uh, and the number of, uh, you know, televisions. Televisions have, you know, almost everyone in the Western world at one point had a television. Uh, th these are simple things, but nevertheless had circuits attached to them. And so, even given those two things, we, we really have to question whether or not the the presence of a circuit is the thing that makes something a bomb. Uh, and of course, it really isn't. The presence of something that makes something a bomb is the presence of explosive material. And unfortunately, we have not associated in the mind of the general public uh, what is and is not explosive material. And all we have really associated with is what's easy to put on television as a way of kind of triggering fear, uh, which is things that not everyone has experienced building, which is circuits. And so we, we've made this as association in the public mind uh, between things that look like uh, bombs and, you know, bombs, and only in this kind of narrow scope of what's possible to put on television, which turned out very poorly for a young student recently. Now, I, again, how can we treat this differently? How can we look at this situation and kind of weigh against uh, what, what other kinds of associations we could have made at the time? And uh, you really have to look at how, wh when you kind of gauge what something is, uh, the chance of it being a bomb versus the chance of it being something else. And if you have, you know, no experience with electronics whatsoever, uh, it might be worth asking someone with electronics knowledge uh, what the answer to that question is. Um, and unfortunately, the experience with electronics is not being diffused widely enough into society that we can actually have this kind of widespread appreciation of what is and is not dangerous. Uh, this is a problem, and a bigger problem, than having or not having bombs present in places that are public. Because we will continue to make this kind of mistake and not just in the case of this particular kind of circuit. We're going to mistake other kinds of circuits for other things unless we can get a wide enough understanding of this technology that has been developed in this past 150 years, that is electronics, uh, for us to really appreciate what is and is not dangerous.
There's also uh, something called uh, baiting or race baiting, where you associate negative or negative feelings and negative emotions with usually some group, uh, some typically a minority group, uh, so that people, especially people who don't have a lot of access to that particular uh, group, uh, will associate negative things with them. But again, it's worth considering that uh, people will do this on purpose just to manipulate your perception of those groups. Uh, and other people will, will go along with them, as we've described with the bandwagon argument video, uh, how uh, they will basically fall for that, and then that will become kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy of how you view that group, how that group interacts with your group, and then the, uh, because you treat them negatively to start with, they'll tra kind of treat you negatively to follow with, and then it's, it, it kind of feeds it as a negative feedback loop from there, uh, with the end result being a lot of conflict, a lot of people getting hurt, uh, and uh, political changes happening that might not have happened if we associated, or if we didn't associate negative things without purpose with a group that uh, is really not that much different than yours. And of course, you can do it the opposite way, too. could make the argument. Isaac Newton was smart. Isaac Newton was white. Therefore, white people are smart. But if you did so, you would be making a mistake. Because, again, there's a large group here that you're generalizing about based on one example. Uh, and, you know, sure, you there, there is at least one smart person in the group of all you know white people who have ever been born. But to draw this particular conclusion, you would need much, much stronger evidence to do so. Um, and nevertheless, people do make this kind of argument, uh, especially in areas or groups that don't necessarily have a lot of contact with people from other cultures, except when filtered through the lens of race baiting. And so you'll find groups of people that treat other people of other skin colors differently based on arguments like this, even though uh, this only is, again, one particular piece of anecdotal data uh, that does not fully describe why white people could be smart, uh, or why the connect, or why there would be a connection between this particular data point and the conclusion. Now, one thing to point out uh, is not all associations between groups. Uh, or not, not all things that you could say about groups are associations uh, purely based on that group itself. You can talk about the structure of groups. So there are, for example, uh, and we when we've talked about the is-ought problem, uh, we, we talked about values and the way that you can say that things ought to be. Well, for every layer of the way things ought to be, I, every kind of value that you could hold people accountable to, there's going to be groups that believe in that value and that organize themselves based on the organizing principles inherent in that value. So for example, there are uh, institutions where people are hired and have jobs and will pay attention when their, their leaders tell them to do things. And especially when there's a very strong culture uh, that enforces conformity and enforces order following, it, there, there can be a, a very ordered uh, and predictable response of that group external events. So for example, if we observe a group that has this internal consistency of participating in uh, terrible things, such as the G20 cops when they arrested blocks full of people here in Canada with no crime being committed, uh, then you can start to predict things about the structure of that group, not necessarily about the members other than the fact that they are participating in a structured activity. Uh, you should be careful if you describe those groups that you're not necessarily just associating with them to that group, uh, rather than uh, describing the system that they are a part of 
and the way that it holds itself together, and the way that it enforces uh, its values being acted upon by its members. Another way that this particular fallacy is relevant today is the association between people. This world is a very connected world, and there's a lot of people who know other people. Um, I, in particular, uh, know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows Osama, or probably knows, or knew when he was still alive, Osama bin Laden. It's because the world is a very connected place. When people grow up, they have childhood friends, they, they have encountered people and have positive experience with those people, and you can't always control that experience and the context that it happens in. And there are people who, again, are very popular, so you can have uh, very quickly uh, a, a social relationship with someone who shares a social relationship with a wide number of people uh, who, again, may not control the, the, the types of people that they, they associate with quite so much. Now, it's worth considering that the people who you closely associate with will affect you, your character, your nature, etc. But at the same time, it's not a complete effect. They don't, they don't absolutely control you most of the time. You are an individual uh, with your own characteristics, your own behavior, etc. And inferring all of that purely from the people you associate with would be an error, even if the U.S. government tries to pretend that that is a reasonable thing to do. And like other fallacies, this is related to other videos we've taken so far. It's related to the argument to emotion, uh, because negative emotions are unfortunately very transitive, i.e. they can be uh, bled through from one topic to another if you associate the two topics uh, both in time and in space or in any other way that your brain can appreciate or perceive. Uh, you can use this to your advantage if you're clever. Uh, so, for example, if you're like me and you're interested in losing weight, uh, if you ever get sick and you're really sick, uh, especially if it's like a flu or something like that, uh, go eat something like chocolate or, or something that would cause you to take more calories in than you probably should be taking in because your brain will automatically associate the, the, the process of being sick and wanting to avoid being sick with that other thing, so in this case, chocolate. So if you want to not eat chocolate so much for the rest of your life, eat it when you're sick and kind of force your brain to make the association. But at the same time, try not to make associations between things you do want to do in the future. It's related to the genetic fallacy. And you could really view this as a generalization of the genetic fallacy. Because you're drawing this kind of conclusion about an individual from the group. Uh, in a similar way, you could probably see this as related to the composition and division fallacies. Uh, it's related to the Texas sharpshooter, the gambler's fallacy, and the proverbs video, uh, in that we're, we're talking really about making guesses, and making hypotheses, and making uh, ways of looking at the world, uh, and, and kind of coming up with them. Uh, and as described in those three videos, it's fine to come up with these ideas, but you have to be really careful about accepting them as true. Uh, you have to be really careful that they don't predispose you to miss the, uh, the, the crucial part that actually does describe how things interact, how groups are actually constituted, how people are, in, or what people intend, what people do, what people can do or will do, uh, etc. Uh, it's related to Venn diagrams because you can often enough kind of draw out the Venn diagram of a situation and it'll make clear uh, that there's more possibilities than you might otherwise be considering. So, for example, if we draw out a circle containing the people who were Nazis uh, and a circle containing the people who were vegetarians, you will note that Hitler is in the middle of these two categories. But there is also two, two other categories of Nazis that are not vegetarians, which there were some, and vegetarians that were not Nazis, which again, there were some. And so if you purely view uh, one in terms of the other, you're really just looking at this middle area, 
And so sometimes if you draw the Venn diagram of the situation, it, it forces you to see that there are other areas worthy of consideration. For example, the set that are neither Nazis or vegetarian. It's related to the fallacy of the beard, because in many cases, you're dealing between extremes, and you're dealing with, uh, especially when you're dealing with groups, uh, complex uh, congregations of people with different interests and different ideas and different intents, etc. Humanity is capable of terror and wonder, peace and atrocity, genius and stupidity, it's all of it, and more. Uh, and every subset of humanity usually contains a microcosm of the whole. Uh, so if you're dealing with one group, there's probably inside of that group uh, kind of subsets that will have various properties that you could point to and make look good or make look bad. They'll all have extremists, they'll all have moderates, uh, and it's worth considering uh, when you're talking especially about groups uh, that you're not drawing a conclusion based on a subset uh, when you could be talking about the whole. It's also worth pointing out that you can negate often uh, general terms uh, by association. Uh, so in the, this particular case, if you try to make the case that all vegetarians are good people, the existence of Hitler here actually does disprove that. But what you can't do is say that all vegetarians are bad people because Hitler is part of this group. That would be in error to do so. So in conclusion, uh, some might suggest that I purely just analyze the argument and not the argument. Uh, I don't particularly believe this. I, I think that we can do better than that. Uh, but we should always leave op the door open for the possibility that our interpretation of their intent and their character is wrong, and that we may, and that they may have more uh, or a more complex intent than we're giving them credit for. That the situation that we're looking at, the thing that we're drawing this general conclusion about, may be looking at it from the wrong angle. That our data may be incomplete. That we've accidentally been, you know, committed this. Texas sharpshooter-like uh, data collection, uh, we've accidentally made a mistake in our, in our interpretation. So as long as we can be willing to make those mistakes and to be willing to improve and clarify how we look at the world, we should be able to do better than our first association that we make, uh, but hopefully we can. So uh, as usual, if you uh, have any associations uh, that you'd like to make this video feel free to leave them anywhere where this video is posted. Uh, there should be a Bitcoin donation address at the bottom here so that you can fund our whiteboard marker supply, which you can always use. And uh, hopefully you enjoy. See you in uh, the next video.